people can change anything they want to. And that means everything in the world. Show me any country and there'll be people in it. It's time to take the humanity back into the center of the ring and follow that for a time. You know, think on that. Without people, you're nothing. Without people, you're nothing. Stoke the fire. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode three of Stoke the Fire, a culture, lifestyle, and occasional music podcast with me, Matt Stocks, and my excellent friend, Jesse Leakes. Jesse, how are you, brother? I'm well, man. How are you doing, brother? As I'm sure I'm going to say often when we get together like this, I am all the better for seeing you, my dear yeah. friend. Likewise, my man. Likewise. It's a nice, uh, I wouldn't say break from reality because it is our reality, but it's something I look forward to uh, every week now, for sure. It's been uh, a part of my weekly routine where I gear up to do this, and it's really nice. It's a nice outlet to have, for sure. Well, I don't know whether you've noticed this, but I've really felt over the last few weeks like we're in a new dawn. and The weather mm -hmm. is obviously a big part of that. Spring is very much, not all the time, but often now here in the UK. Um, the sun's been shining. You know, It just feels really like bright and fresh and crisp out. Um, this podcast, I think, is a huge part of that for me as well. You know, Getting into this exciting new thing with you has breathed new new life into me um and it just really feels like right now like there's a glimmer of hope once again are yeah. you feeling that yeah i think uh you're right about the sunshine you can't deny i mean this winter for me was was very long and you know i don't have a car anymore i i literally just let go of a lot of things during this past year so i've kind of been stuck in the house and just watching the snow, which the snow is nice, but it's those gray days where it's kind of rainy coming out of winter into, into spring that are, it's tough. And then the sunny days. Yeah. I just want to go out and run around and, and frolic like a child. It's great. Yeah. It's definitely putting me in better spirits and the smell, you can smell the mountains are starting to give off the scent of spring. It's just, it's a beautiful transition. One of my favorite times of year. So I'm actually happy to be home for this, regardless of me missing the road. It's nice to see the change of season. Well, you've been actually busting out the real life fire pit as well, obviously, because this is for the time being, at least a Zoom based podcast. We can't actually sit around a fire, but that is very much the theme of, of what we're coming to this show with. But you um, on the Instagram live chats that you and I have been doing through the Stoke the Fire pod Instagram page, which if people aren't following, you should, because uh, that's very much an extension of this show, Stoke the Fire pod. Um, we've kind of just been jumping on there last minute surprise to just connect with each other, take questions from people and connect with people that are, you know, beginning to discover the show and, and follow us and get involved with it. But you've actually been busting out the real life fire and yeah. I, I get fire envy every time I see it. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful thing. It's something that I, I do on my own anyway. So I figure why not start including people? And I also think um, it'd be a nice thing to add into those people who are subscribing and, and, and looking to get additional content you know, I like the idea of having an IG chat for sure, a free for all, but eventually I'd like to invite listeners on to hang out with me via Zoom. I'll bring my freaking computer out and you can Zoom chat with me while I'm by the fire. I have no problem doing that as the weather warms up. Um, it's it's a cool way to do things because you get to see like, you know, the smoke and the fire and I'm outside of my backyard. It's different than my crazy little studio here. But um, it's something I love to do anyway, and I'd love to invite people to do it with me. So the IG chat thing's been fun because I think people like it. You get people who are in, in cities, you know, commenting like, oh, fire, how amazing is that? And it's something I don't take for granted. I love it. And another, you know, as we've mentioned, that's one of the ideas where this podcast even came from. So it just seems, you know, like it makes sense just to bring people around the fire for real, actual fire. And you mentioned getting people on the Zoom chats and involved as well. That's definitely something we want to do um, in this show a lot. We've set up a, a Gmail account. So if you want to get in touch with us and share stories, suggest guests, put forward questions or invite yourself on, um, then please do reach out and get in touch with us. Stokethefirepod at gmail.com is where you'll find us. Um, and just whilst uh, we're... Side note real quick. Don't plug your band there. Don't send us stuff like that because i've seen that already and listen you can message me on instagram or whatever check out my band but like don't don't flood our you know with that stuff oh, please <laughs> appreciate it your band's demo can go to me on instagram or whatever <laughs> 
I mean, you have to appreciate the hustle. There's a little bit of that, but um, yeah, this isn't this isn't a kind of a, a platform to plug records, <laughs> even for the big guests that we get on, even for established artists who we will have coming on the show soon. It won't always just be me and Jesse, but even yeah. when they do come on and they may well have a record out, this isn't the place to be coming on and and pitching and and plugging, is it? This isn't this isn't what this show is all about. Yeah, we'll talk about art and music and and movies or whatever, and you know, if we have an actor on, we'll talk about their films. But I, you know, I like the idea of not having it specifically be a plug thing with with dates and times and and you know shout outs and all that stuff. I I, I think we're more interested, um, and I'll do this myself, obviously, um, talking about the the inspiration behind your music, talking about why that art was created as opposed to like, you know, doing a plug. Cause there's enough, there's enough, listen, there's enough publications. There's enough magazines, online magazines, people to do that kind of stuff. I have no interest in doing that. I've spent most of my life doing that kind of stuff and it's yeah. just dry and lifeless. Like I'd rather talk to the human, know what the, the human behind the artwork, where it comes from the, the deep inspiration for it, the earth shattering, things that happened in your life that's the kind of stuff i'm looking for when we have guests on amen and me as an interviewer i've always you know taken that road as well it's never about what angle should we take with this interview it's about let's connect let's discover why we're doing what we're doing why we're here the human element the personal story and journey that we're all on um one thing i want to just touch on jesse because you've, you've sort of segued nicely into what we are going to talk about today there which is indeed you know your latest creative project but oh, plug my new record <laughs> <laughs> when's it out what's the first single yeah, yeah. um but before we get into that just whilst we're still on this kind of glimmer of hope theme i'm not yeah. sure what the lay of the land is in the u.s but here in the uk and don't get me wrong i still have my reservations and i'm not you know losing my mind just yet but a lot of festivals and tours and events are starting to get announced confirmed being put on sale in many cases already selling out and whether or not they go ahead this year or not for me is kind of irrelevant it is just lovely to see people excited again to see them optimistic and hopeful even if it's a little bit overzealous at this stage and unrealistic why shouldn't people be happy man because we've been locked down for a year and just to have some kind of a glimmer of hope and what watching people's reactions to that for me has been so life affirming and encouraging. What's the deal stateside? What's going on over there? Is anything getting reignited just yet or not? Yeah, there's definitely talk of it. And, you know, I've seen some postings about it, but I'm with you as much as I'm hopeful and happy because I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I think as long as people are comfortable with it and you're doing it according to, you know, what people are comfortable with, the, the guidelines, the six foot, the, you know, whatever you got to do to get it done, let's do it. You know, I'm seeing the, the shift up here where I live in the Catskills, the restaurants, you know, we've been open up here with the social distancing and all that, but because we are seeing some of the places start to open and Massachusetts was the first one to really sort of step forward and say, they're going to be opening places for events, live events, music events, you know, and to me, that's just great. And it also opens the people's hearts for hope. You know, I think that's what we need right now, you know, with the turn of spring and with the turn of events, you're right. There has definitely been something in the air the past couple of weeks. It just feels like we're on to something new. We're finally shifting into a different part of our lives. And, you know, I think we had to take one step at a time. It's good to be excited, but also, you know, I'm personally don't, I'm not counting on Kill switch, for example, to to do anything this year. I would be super surprised if that happens. I'm sure it's going to be, you know, bigger events, people who have a little bit more money to burn that can afford to do, you know, a show at half capacity or, you know, one, you know, whatever regulations they're putting out. But the bottom line is, it feels good. It's a nice thing to sort of see. And then, you know, again, I can see the shift in people. There's excitement for the possibilities of the world opening up, even if it's just a little bit. Hell yeah. Well, you get a glimmer of light and that's all you need. I think after a year of darkness, even just a glimmer. And also, um, you know, first and foremost, it's obviously people's health and safety. And I never thought I'd say this because I'm kind of against health and safety, but in a pandemic, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. in a pandemic, it is very much about health and safety. And that's obviously paramount first and foremost. So for me, when things are, safe enough to return that's when they will and that will be you know whenever that is we can't rush it 
we can't rush towards it. We just have to sit back. And for me, it's all about making the most of the moment, even in the lockdown. And that's what I've been doing a lot of this year. That's what we've been talking a lot about. And as much as, yeah, it will be great when things do return, live your life for today now as well. Don't think, oh my God, in six months, shit's about to get awesome. That's good that you're excited about six months from now, but let's also work on today and uh, and just get excited about life here now, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. That's why I tell people because I do a lot of chatting on on Cameo uh, and on social media as well. And people are always asking me for advice because for some reason people think I got the answers. I don't. I've definitely been through stuff and I've learned and I've gained, you know, a good perspective through my my um, experience. The one thing I got to tell you know to piggyback on what you just said is so important. On those days when there's a little bit of that hope and that shimmer, go out and do something. You, you don't have to go out and, and be around a ton of people to feel good. Like you and I, oh, we plug this. I'm sure we're going to continue plugging it on every show. Get out. <laughs> get outdoors. Go for a nice, long, brisk walk. There's nothing like just getting your blood g- going because it actually fixes this too. That's a huge thing I'm a huge proponent of. When I'm feeling down or if my friends are feeling down, I'm like, have you gone out for a walk? Have you gone out for a jog? Go out for a bike ride? Go out for a hike? That shit is crucial. And now that the weather's getting better, it's even better. Just get outside. I urge you people, get outside. And nature is a beautiful equalizer. And if you can, if weather permits, please listen to this show outside. If you can get a fire going whilst you listen to Stoke the Fire, that's the dream right there. Light up the flames tag a picture like take a picture tag us in it stoke the fire pod facebook twitter instagram we'd love to see those coming in as the springtime fresh air starts to you know sweep all over the world we would love to see people kicking it around the campfire listening to this show um that's kind of the dream really isn't it jesse yeah get your bluetooth speaker light a cigar up have a drink and and allow us to uh to be the voices as you sit around that fire that would be yeah that is the that's the dream for us we don't have very lofty goals except for we want you guys to enjoy this show and if you can enjoy it around a fire that's exactly what we're talking about here you know what else we need to get done as well we need to do some merch i feel like now's the time we've done a few episodes um i feel like we should at least just do like a limited t-shirt run or something just to get things going yeah yeah I'm also feeling like, because I'm sat here drinking away in my peppermint tea, not to be just a total shameless salesman, but we should get some little, like, stoke the fire. You know, like those little um, prison-style mugs that you get? Yeah, 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 totally. Get some stoke the fire ones of them. Then when we're drinking on the show and people are watching via Zoom, they'll they'll see it and go, oh, yeah, I'll get myself one of those. It's like that scene in Wayne's World, too, with the, where they got all the labels and they keep showing all the labels. We can just constantly plug our own show. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a Wayne's World hat in here, but I can't find it. But yeah, we refuse to bow down to corporate sponsors. <laughs> exactly. <I re-watched laughs> it's it's our own brand, so it's not corporate. I rewatched those recently, man. Such funny movies, man. Mike Myers and, and Dana Carvey. What a great duo. Well, one of my favorite, not to detour too much, but we'll do this quickly. One of my favorite stand-up sketches ever is Dana Carvey. He's doing an imagined conversation between Paul McCartney and John Lennon in heaven. Yes. And, and it's about yeah. the state of the world. Now he's like, what's going on down there, Paul? And he's like, oh, there's this guy, Kanye West, John. And he's like, oh. And he talks about Kim Kardashian. Oh, is she kind of like Yoko? And he's like, no, no, she's an influencer, John. On and on and on. One of the best it sketch routines. It's so good, isn't it? Yeah, it's fun when you can see an older comedian um, still be relevant and funny. I mean, you know, c- comedy is just a huge thing in my heart because it's laughter is just great medicine. And you've got all different kinds of comedians. Um, and he's just one that aged gracefully. It's it's those comics who just are funny. They're not, they don't have to try to be funny. That's just who they are. You know, one I, one person I always point to, and he's not hysterical, but he's just a funny guy. He's like Billy Crystal. He just walks. He is a comic. He just lives it. You know, I love that. And Dana Carvey is one of those guys. He doesn't have to try. He's just a funny guy. And his impersonations are impeccable. He also does the routine when he's impersonating Barack Obama, um, George Bush, and Donald Trump, all three yeah. of them. And he does all three spot on. Spot on. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Dan, I'm a- shout out Dan Carvey. They're making a new Wayne's World as well. Did you see that? No, I, can't I didn't. I have my know. reservations, but why not? Yeah, it's like the new Coming to America. I'm not sure about that one either. Eddie Murphy, old school Eddie Murphy is some of my favorite shit in the world. But, you know, that's Hollywood. They just rehash stuff and keep it going. So I guess we'll see what happens, right? 
yeah, we're in the age of the remake, the reboot, the prequel, the sequel. It's like, why? Because, you know, with the whole Ghostbusters thing, people were up in arms. You can't have female Ghostbusters. Why not? I'm all for female Ghostbusters, but what I would prefer is just a new storyline with all yeah. with, with all the movies. Rather than rebooting a franchise with different sexes in the lead roles, just make a Ghostbuster equivalent for women that's a new thing or whatever yeah. it is. Original ideas, Hollywood. Where are they? Yeah, it's la- it's lazy. There's a lot of laziness right now. Just trying to cash in, I guess. You know, it's it's like that with the music industry too. You're rehashing a sound, you know, rehashing a band. Yeah, it's frustrating, but money. People like it for some reason, you know. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Jesse Leach. When you and Adam D started Times of Grace, was there any idea in your mind that it was going to be a, a band? Even like, did you aim to tour? Or, or even no. like turn it into a money making thing, or was it literally just two dudes? I mean, I don't want to go too much into the first record because I feel like we could do a whole other episode on that another time because we're in the here and the now. Yeah, episode, looking forward. <laughs> well, episode one of the show was very much about our shared history, our friendship, and and who we are. Episode two last week was about the events of the last twelve months, twenty twenty, and how the the maelstrom of madness that's gone on in the last year has informed perhaps the uh, well this show and where we're coming from. And then this uh, week, as Jesse said, is all about looking ahead, uh, getting excited for twenty twenty one. And there is a new Times of Grace record on the way, so I know you're excited about that. I know there's loads to talk about, but yeah, just kind of for a bit of background, when you start that group ten years ago, is it just going to be a one off? studio project that's just aimed to kind of unleash some creative things that you and Adam had going on. What was the original intention of the band? Yeah, so originally Adam came at me with, I have a project I've been working on because he was off tour with Kill Switch. He threw his back out. So he's stuck in a hospital in London, um, not knowing if he's going to walk again, like just facing down his uh, mortality as a musician. And through that, he wrote, the times of grace, right? I want to say like eight songs off that first record. <clears throat> Last year. And uh, thank you. And uh, he approached me and said, look, I'm working on this thing. I need help. I'm not good with lyrics. You're good with lyrics. Write some stuff for me. Let's see what happens. So long story short, I started writing with him and he's like, all right, let's make this a thing. Let's make it a project. But the idea was it would be a studio project that we would both be able to utilize our creative talents to do something different than things that we were working on or doing. At the time, I wasn't doing anything. I was in a band called The Empire Shall Fall, but we were just doing regional stuff. It wasn't like a career band. I was working a full-time job at the time and, and actually quite depressed. What were you life. doing? What was the gig? What was the job? Oh, at the time, I was asked to do that. I had just gotten off the road with Seamless, broke, way in debt. And I was valet parking cars at a medical facility in Scarsdale, New York. So it's a very high end multi million dollar practice. So we're talking about people driving in with their BMWs, Mercedes, really nice cars. And I would be the one greeting you, taking your keys, giving you a ticket, and parking your car. That was my job at the time. It was the first job I got off the road, transitioning back into civilian life. Did anybody very- ever recognize you in that job? Uh, no, no, because, you know, most very wealthy old people that have health problems are not, not listening to. <laughs> That's not your demographic. No, no, it's a very humbling experience. But Adam gave me this project and it really gave me a lot of hope and, and I put my all into it. And, uh, you know, we just navigated strange times, him with his physical and me with my mental. And that's where that album came out. So when we were talking about making it and as we recorded it over about a year on and off, there was never a talk of, oh, this is going to be a band. We're going to go on tour with this. It was like, let's make this a record. Let's add layers and textures that we know we can't recreate live and just let's put out a great record. You know how the Beatles did like their records. They, they didn't plan on touring. They didn't plan on playing them out. They just put out these great records towards the end of their career. And not that this is a, a Beatles thing at all, but the idea of like, let's who cares if we can't pull this off live, let's just do it. There was no thought about recreating it live, uh, which – presented quite a challenge when we finally did um, perform it live. So it was just kind of out of necessity to be creative and to have a different um, avenue to, to write within metal, but also just allow it to be what it is without the confines of Kill Switch and that whole thing. Because I wasn't, you know, I was not in Kill Switch at the time. I was doing my own thing. So it's kind of a cool, interesting way we got kicked off and started with that. 
Were you and Adam always in touch? Did you remain friends when you left Killswitch? Yeah, uh, he was the one guy that, I mean, I eventually squashed it with him because it was a, a little bit of awkward blood because of the way I left it was very abrupt because um, I didn't have the wherewithal. I didn't really know how to say I had issues and I was losing myself and depressed. But um, yeah, after all that was squashed, those guys are just generous and great. They're really sweet guys. Um, but Adam was always there. I'd get a phone call from him or a text from him at least, uh, you know, I would say four or five times a year while they were touring full time. He would always reach out or I'd get a phone call like one in the, in the morning and he was drunk, like uncle, because they call me uncle. And, uh, you know, I'm drunk. What are you doing? Why'd you leave the band, you asshole? Like just busting my balls constantly. Um, so he's always been a good, a dear friend and a brother. So, you know, it didn't surprise me he reached out, but it definitely surprised me that he had written a record and he didn't want it to be a Kill Switch record. That kind of blew my mind a little bit. And he thought of me. It's like, whoa. Okay, cool. How does it differ, would you say, from Kill Switch, the first album? And then we'll segue across into the new record. So with that first album, obviously, it's two guys from the band that, you know, cemented and established the Kill Switch sound. So when you're going into the studio to make that, obviously, you want to make something that's different. Um, but presumably, you weren't actively trying to make something that was different. It just was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you could draw some parallels from song structure that some of them technically could be a Kill Switch style song. But um, I, you know, I was really careful to add more yelling, different sounds that I didn't necessarily use a lot in Kill Switch, and then sort of on the more slower, slower, more rock metal type stuff. You know, going into deeper parts of my voice, and Adam and I interchanging, going back and forth. He had a lot more presence on that record than he did in any Kill Switch song, because usually he'll sing like a little segment of the song or the bridge or backup harmony so he's been you know peppered throughout kill switch where times of grace was the first time that he actually took the reins on some of this stuff and would take a verse and we'd trade verses or you know on that first record he even had i believe one or two songs that were really his that he sang um the last song on that record is just him singing there's no me on it at all so that was kind of a foreshadowing of what is to come on this next record um it was just nice to see him spread his wings creatively and right outside of the genre that we're known for, the, you know, the Kill Switch signature sound. Um, so we definitely tried to play with that a little bit. And that being said, I think we did that even more moving forward. We were more conscious of that, really setting ourselves apart from not only Kill Switch, but also that first record. Well, with this year, obviously there's been so much pain and heartache and, and negatives, but you do have to take the positives and a couple of good things that have come out of this year for me and you personally, one being this podcast. Um, I don't think this podcast, although we were discussing the idea of doing live Q&A evening with tours, um, to be able to actually sit down and start a weekly show, I think, uh, is something that's come out of this year. And also, is it safe to say that this record, the Times of Grace album, probably wouldn't have come out this year were it not for coronavirus because you'd be on the road, you'd be on tour with Kill Switch, yeah. and you'd be all over the country and indeed the world, so there'd be no time to... So what, was the record already done before the pandemic? So it was, yeah, that's what I was going to say. So the record has been done for a while. Um, we did get it done regardless of touring. But, you know, with having a band like Killswitch, which is our, our career, it's, you know, the legacy band, the band that takes precedence over anything we do musically, having that in the forefront and having just released Atonement, fairly recently prior to this, you know, pandemic, this is, you know, we are embarking on our first real headline tour for that record to work it. So, um, yeah, this album would not have come out while we were touring. It did, it wouldn't make sense. We have no time to promote it. People wouldn't pay attention to it as much. I don't think if there wasn't some sort of a break. So yeah, potentially this album wouldn't even have come out this year and maybe even not next year, maybe somewhere in the middle of next year. Um, truly. So it's been, a blessing as far as that's concerned to to have an album that has been sitting there because with the last record it was the same thing the album was done and it sat for like almost two years before we were able to legally and like re you know release it so with this one it's nice because i've been sitting with this record i've been listening to it it's grown on me it's you know i went from fresh ears to like i've listened to this record so many times now which is good when we eventually perform it someday but 
it's frustrating too at the same time when you've got something that you're excited about that's fresh and you just want people to hear it. So to me, it's 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 a relief that it's finally going to see the light of day. Finally, you know, a couple of weeks ago we signed contracts and things have been just slowly snowballing to this release. So it's it's exciting and um, yeah, it wouldn't have happened without this whole pandemic thing. So you have to shift your perspective. And that's a big lesson I've learned over this past year is you have to shift your perspective to dwelling on the negative dwelling and being bummed about something you can't control to harnessing that energy and and finding new life and a new lease to like push forward with something. And this is definitely the blessing in disguise is being able to release this record. It seems like the recurring theme in that project with the first album and this new one is redemption, reinvention, um, is that safe to say rebirth um, from a personal point of view, not so much from a creative point of view? Well, from a creative probably as well, but it seems like when you're talking about the first record there and what we'll hopefully get into now with with the new one is a lot was going on in, in, in at least your life. I'm not asking you to speak for Adam on either occasions, um, but in in regards to you, first time around, a lot of stuff. This time around, arguably even more yeah it's the running joke with adam and i it's like if, if shit goes really bad in our lives it's time to write a new <laughs> which i mean times of grace record um yeah times of grace is just it, it's a blessing and a curse you know it's it occurs and that's why it's taken so long for so many reasons because we started working on this record shit like five six years ago like the idea of it the demos all those things and at the time my life was still kind of, you know, in an interesting place, I'd say the unraveling, the true unraveling of my relationship, my past marriage hadn't started quite yet, but um, it was getting there. And Adam, you know, was dealing with fatigue from the road and facing his own mental illnesses. Um, and as time progressed, and as we started to work on this record, our lives started to fall apart um, in true times of grace fashion. We captured those moments and they are, I would say to me, much more painful um, memories are captured on this record. And the interesting thing about this one for me personally is we started writing it when I was dealing with the letting go of a very toxic, dark part of my life, the unraveling of an 18 year relationship and seeing that person for who they are. And it's something I don't talk about much because I don't want to drag anyone through the mud. I like to push forward and stay positive. But the damage that had been done at that point was was hard. It was deep. And I am proud to say I captured that stuff lyrically, poetically in these songs. And as we were writing this record and as I was going through those transitions, my life started to change. You come out of the other side of a dark situation and you learn to find yourself again. You learn to get your footing. Anyone who's gone through a painful divorce or a relationship breaking up where you've spent a good chunk of your life believing that this was forever and then coming to that realization where it's not, that's a hard, hard thing to do. It's very painful, but it can also be the best thing to ever happen to you. And during the making of this record, my life started to change. I started to see things differently and I started to find love for myself and get back on my feet again. And, and I found new love. So through the entire process, a couple of years of this album, I went from being depressed and despondent to, to finding my feet again, to finally finding hope. So there's actually one song on this record that was like the last song I wrote for the record. And it's about finding that redemption. It's called, uh, it's called rescue. And it's about rescuing yourself and finding new love to help rescue you and pull you out from all the sadness and darkness. So aside from that one song, the rest of those songs are painful, painful songs for Adam and I both. What you described there, I've been on a, I mean, nothing like to the extent of what you've been through because I was only with my ex-partner for three years, which is a significantly less period of time than 18. And that's one sixth of what you're talking about. But um, 
obviously you've been having a little fl- flick through my book, which I put out at the end of last year. And yeah. the the introduction to that book, it doesn't really go too deep into it. Again, out of respect for, for this ex of mine, I didn't want to go revealing what had really gone on and what had happened because it, was, you know, it wasn't really relevant as well. But I, I do allude to the fact that this relationship that I had that cherished, I, I cherished, fell apart. And that was a big thing in, in the creative process for me of writing my book, because the, the interviews which form the body of the book from the first 18 months of my podcast, my other podcast, Life in the Stocks, a lot of those conversations took place when I was still in the relationship, but it was falling apart. So when I sat down to transcribe all of those episodes, I was reliving, you know, the, basically the the downfall of, of yeah. this you know, partnership that I thought like you was, was going to be the one that would last all, you know, for all time. Um, it didn't. I want to ask you, Jesse, when we did the live Q and a together, which was a couple of years ago. Now, um, you talk in that about the deep connection that you and your ex-wife had, and you know, you were very open, not just with me, but with social media, I would say as well with your love and feelings towards her. Um, you don't have to go too far into it, but what changed? Because the last thing I knew, you were like still connected and happy, and it, you know, it was a positive mm. relationship. And then you're divorced, and it's over. And I was like, "Whoa, what the fuck went down?" Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. I mean, the kind of person that I am, I would just say everything and be completely honest about it, and I don't care. The one reason why I don't and haven't done this is to protect that other person for whatever reason. And um, we haven't even spoken since the divorce. Um, So anyone who has been through this type of a relationship can attest. When you're with somebody who is a pathological liar, somebody who's so good at lying that you believe it. And through the the anxieties and the worries and the suspicions. And, you know, I always suspected something was off. I always knew it. I'd come home from tour and I just, there was something there. You can read people's body language. You can sense when something is off. But I kept pushing through and I kept giving her the benefit of the doubt and I kept building her up and showing her, you know, I I guess I was overcompensating. Let's be real. When you're in that type of a situation and you're trying to do damage control, I would take to social media and sort of build her up and say things and try to make her feel good. It's like, you know, trying to make it work regardless of what's going on behind the scenes. And um, yeah, that was, I think that was a, um, a knee jerk reaction to try to fix things that I thought were were broken. And it just got to the point where I could no longer suture those wounds. I couldn't hide the bleeding. And there's a song called Mend You on the record that is about that, where you just can't hide how bad it is anymore. And there's not, there's no way to go back. You can't repair it. You've tried every, you've exhausted, and I have exhausted everything in my arsenal and my power to the point where you're so exhausted, you just don't care anymore what happens. Like I, you know, I got to the point with her where I was like, can you just say what's on your mind because I know what you're saying is not true. And anyone who's ever dealt with that type of a person, it it takes the life out of you. And you become, you know, you go from blaming yourself to like finally seeing the light and moving forward with your life. And that's what it got to me. I finally was like, I'm not taking this anymore. And it was, you know, this one particular thing that happened where I was like, it was staring me right in the face. The thing that I knew all along was just, it was obvious. So I fucking had enough self-love to just pull the ejector seat and get out. And um, that being said, it was the best thing I've ever done. And, uh, you know, we can continue to dwell on some of the darkness and pain of this record, but I have to say, cause there's just this thing inside me that's like, you gotta say it, I'm happier now than I've ever been in my life. And um, coming out of a toxic, abusive, hard relationship is so liberating. And I wake up every morning to these days and just, I'm like, oh, thank God I've moved on. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. And anyone who's gone through that knows, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're going through it right now, it's temporary. It will get better. I promise you that. 
Yeah, I consider myself so lucky in that regard. I've had a lot of pain and trauma and bullshit in my life, but I've never been in a toxic relationship. I've always had fairly healthy, positive experiences, and they've just ran their course, and and that's that. And and my last partner, like the breakup, was perfectly amicable, and there was no fights, there was no shouting, there was no you know maliciousness, there was none of that. It was, I mean, if anything, I kind of wanted more emotion than, than what I got but it was quite an easy just we both walked away and haven't seen or spoken to each other since but yeah I can only imagine what it's like to be I guess you feel trapped whether it's a physically abusive thing or an emotionally abusive thing you feel trapped because you know obviously at the moment this is a slight detour perhaps but I think it's a, a related side note is at the moment we're seeing certain celebrities uh I don't think we need to name them because you can just Google it, but there's certain high profile musicians uh, at the moment that are under the microscope because of their abusive, in some cases, criminal and deplorable behavior. And I see a lot of response from generally male people saying, well, if he was that bad, why did you stay with him? And I think people really don't understand if they haven't been in that situation, how hard and near impossible it can feel to get out. Right. Well, yeah, I think, yeah, that's a very valid point. And I think when you're dealing with someone who's got narcissistic traits and who's a pathological liar, that's a lot to navigate and you're being manipulated constantly. So you, you get to a point where you don't know what's up and what's down anymore. So, you know, a lot of people who do stay in these relationships and, you know, me included, you're just, you don't have a sense of wherewithal. You've been beaten into submission so much. So, and, you know, the abuse I speak of was not physical because to me, physical is obvious. I, you know, if, if there was physical stuff, I'd be like, I'm, I'm out easier said than done. I know for some people who have to deal with that, unfortunately, but it was manipulation. And I think a lot of times when you're dealing with people like the person you're alluding to or people like of that ilk or that character flaw, the narcissism, the, they have an incredible way to twist things. So whatever you say to sort of confront them, Somehow they have this crazy ability to twist it and put it back on you. And then you are the one somehow apologizing for even bringing it up. That's a mind fuck on some whole other level. And when you've dealt with it over and over again, you stop to, you stop seeing it. You stop seeing that, that this is a toxic trait. This is something that is, you know, being spun on you and you start to believe the lie. So you start living the same lie that is being perpetuated and you don't even realize that it's toxic or abusive. And uh, there's a certain amount of charm that goes with that. I, I have found when you're dealing with narcissistic behavior, those people who are narcissists, they're a lot of the times very clever, likable people that when shit's going on behind the scene and you're dealing with it, the person, the people that are dealing with them on the outside world, whether it be social media or your circle of friends, are seeing a completely different person. So when the issues come up, or if you try to vent to a friend, they're like, what are you talking about? This person's amazing. Like, what a great person, great personality, super outgoing, supportive friend. Like, just, you couldn't find a better human being. But behind closed doors and in, in, in private, there's a whole other side that comes out, and it's manipulation. And that's the problem with relationships like this uh, and people who are victims of it, because truly they're victims of it. You're getting fucked in the head. And it's it's something that takes a long time to, un- I'm still unraveling behaviors that I've been, you know, learned because of it. And thankfully the, the woman that I'm with now has seen a rough life. You want to talk about a survivor. My girlfriend currently is is a total survivor. And, uh, you know, when we first met, we were just friends hanging out, you know, I was just kind of going out and being crazy and single. And, you know, I met her and, uh, I was treating her like every other girl. Cause you know, after a long relationship, I went out and kind of a little crazy for a while. <laughs> Cause it's like shit, 18 years, that's a lot of pent up aggression and behavior. So I kind of went nuts for a while. And then during that time I met her and heard her story. And she taught me a lot about helping me to like deprogram from being in a toxic relationship. So, you know, she started out as a friend and sort of a life coach. <laughs> and then I eventually just fell in love with her because she's an amazing person. But uh, yeah, it, it, you know, again, for those listeners and those people who don't know what it's like, reserve judgment on people when they're trying to tell you about their lives. Reserve judgment on, you know, it's something I'm not vocal about, about my own self, but I try to like lift other people up in a platform who are dealing with abuse because um, it comes in all different kinds of 
you know, all different forms. And it, you don't have to be the typical, you know, a bruised up and abused woman to be an abused person. There's many other ways to be abused. And uh, I only speak of it now because I know it can help people. And this record, especially, I know for a fact is going to be good therapy for people because it's good therapy for me and Adam. And I'm proud of that. And that's part of why I do what I do as a musician is to tell my story, but also tell it in such a way where it's relatable to you, the listener, and you can take those lyrics and those songs and run with them and apply them to your own life because we all want know what it's like to suffer. We all know what it's like to be in pain. Yeah, breakups are just so hard, aren't they? And I've seen so many, I don't want to generalize, but it's often usually male friends that just get broken by not by the relationships, but by the end of said relationships. And and I've seen so many of my male friends in recent times particularly really struggle to find their way out of the fog in that sort of post breakup depression and i think for me right now i haven't found a new partner but i am also the happiest i've ever been because i've found love in myself for myself yeah. and you know just being creative and busy with with this show with you with my own podcast with a book that i've written there's all kinds of other things going on in my life that bring me so much joy and fulfillment and that's enough for me for now um but i said how did you begin to pick up the pieces before you meet corinne how did you begin to pick up the pieces of your broken heart and soul and mind were you just going out and running wild for a little bit was that part of the process it was um because you know i had never woken up next to a stranger i've never really? done that before. really never, never done that before it's um, pretty good right it's not <laughs> and you know you know i really tried to do the thing i tried to be the dude you know i tried to be the rock star for a little while i tried to like own that for a small amount of time and i'll never forget waking up and looking over and being like nah it's, that's not for me that's not for me this because to me there's always been a you know what i thought was a connection with that you know i i just i don't have that kind of a brain and, and trust me i tried I tried to go out and go nuts and it's just, it's not who I am. It's not what I want. I, I, I can't help it. I'm a deep emotional dude. I need more than just a fling. I can't do it. Um, so do you know what though, Jesse, I, I think, cause I've had loads of one night stands and, and I've always approached sort of like courting, if you want to use the old fashioned term, I always like to think maybe i haven't always but i like to think that i treat all women that i come into contact with with respect and i still try and get even if it's just a one night stand i try and make it an emotional memorable soulful like meaningful experience even if it's just short i think you can do that i think if you're both on the same yeah. level level playing field and the cards are on the table and you say here's where i'm at and you know the, the the lady or the the gentleman in question feels the same i think you can have a really beautiful one night stand they're not always just like get drunk wake up with a stranger run for the door kind of scenarios but yeah, that no, was kind of what you were having <laughs> no no you know it's funny you say that no because i did the same thing i really did try to make it a thing it wasn't just a one night so if it was somebody that i was experimenting with couple nights, you know, go on dates. Like it, I made it a thing and it wasn't just one person. I, I, I fit in a bunch of people on a short amount of time. <laughs> you um, fitted them into your schedule. Very oh good. Oh my you. God, I did. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, but you know, I think I did need to do that because it, it did make me realize who I truly am. And you know, to piggyback on what you just said, that's when I started to figure out, you know, I'm a good dude. Like this is, I'm not a shitty person. I'm not, and not to say that behavior is shitty. If it's consensual, have at it, go for it. But uh, to me, I saw I saw the toxicity in it. I saw some of those people that I chose to go on that adventure with were not, they were not the greatest people. And um, that was a process that helped sort of help me start to awaken and find, you know, love for who I am. And a lot of that was just going out and, and going on hikes and, and traveling by myself and just sort of getting to know who I am, which, you know, that process, let's be, let's be clear, that process already started for me. You know, there were enough arguments and incidents prior to the divorce and breakup that I, that it was obvious, the cracks were showing. So how did I deal with those things? I dealt with them in a healthy way. I would take myself out to dinner on tour. You know, if I was, um, I'll never forget this, I, we had a, a couple days between tours and I took myself on vacation, just me 
and treated myself in Hawaii of all places. And that's kind of when I started to realize that, you know, I can do this on my own. I, I can, I can move past and sort of be okay with being alone. So that took a long time to, to sort of work up to, but after the divorce and after my little period of like, uh, you know, whatever I was going through, I started to feel okay being alone. And that's when I moved up here to the to the Catskill Mountains and got my own place, a nice three bedroom house as opposed to a one bedroom apartment in the city, and you know seeing the stars and nature and rediscovering truly rediscovering who I am on my own, and that's when I started to like uh, find my footing and feel good. As much as I was lonely and hurting, it was refreshing to not have to deal with bullshit anymore. You know, the buck stops with me. There's no more uh, weeding through lies and manipulation. It was like a breath of fresh air. Like, oh, here we go. Okay, cool. Life makes so much more sense now. I don't have to deal with this shit. So yeah, I think it's a matter of discover rediscovering who you are is really important. I've been really enjoying that over the last few years. And I wasn't in a toxic relationship. My ex-girlfriend was perfectly lovely, just didn't work out. But um, for me, the joy of the last few years has been discovering who I am and what I want. And when there's nobody else in your life, as you say, it's not overcomplicated. The buck stops with you. And sometimes that can be difficult. And I guarantee a lot of people out there in this last year, with the removal of distractions and places to run and go to and avoid your problems, avoid yeah. your issues, um, we've all been faced, I think, all of us all over the world with right, who am I? Do I like this person? Maybe I need to make some changes and change is always difficult and hard. And uh, admitting that is often difficult. And I think we've all across the board been in this period of readjustment, reevaluation, rebirth seems to be the theme of the last year for so many people I've spoken to. But I do genuinely believe it's all about you first and foremost, and you can only be in a good relationship and be a good partner if you love and respect yourself and you're in a healthy place in your mind on your own, only yeah. then can you give and receive love healthily with another. Well said, 100%. And to piggyback on that, which I can relate this to the record, I can also relate it to, you know, life moving forward is, is having those moments of quiet and alone. Like how often do people shut the music off, shut everything off and sit with yourself and this, I know for a fact, this year has allowed some people to do that. And that's why relationships have fallen apart. That's why some people are going through these major, major changes, uh, um, among other things, you know, struggling financially and stuff, which is a whole other topic. But um, And homeschooling and all the stress that comes with that and losing work. And yeah, man, yeah, it, it's just so you have to navigate those things. But the one thing I will say that is super important is soulless fit you know catching up with yourself and that's a luxury for some people with you if you've got kids or whatever but i do that with myself i have to do it at least once a week go out for a walk and just be by myself i'll bring my headphones but sometimes i don't even put them on i just listen to nature i listen to the wind and allow my brain to sort of catch up to who i am and you know when you've been in a, a crazy toxic relationship you start to unravel and the unraveling can be painful. It can be really hard, but you face these deep truths. And through that, the healing that happens is incredible. And you find moments of, of joy, you know, like there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. You just have to believe that there is. And that journey of mine, I, you know, I'm proud to say it's captured on, on record because some of those deeper, deeper thoughts that happened with me also affected my spirituality, the way that I saw my spiritual walk, the way that I see the world. I think there's one of the more bold songs I've ever written about my criticism for organized religion, my criticism for the hypocrisy and the 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 greed that comes along with a lot of organized religion. And um, the song is Far From Heavenless. And I wrote a poem about this. It was just a free form poem about the hypocrisy of people who are up on this you know, this pulpit is higher, they're placed higher, they're seen as these holy people. And, and some of the stuff that comes out of their mouth is just refuse, it's garbage, it's hatred. And you're talking about, you know, a religion or religions where you're based upon love and God being of love. And it's this double speak of love and then judgment. So, you know, during those quiet moments of reflection of myself and my soul and moving past, you know, a dark relationship, 
I sort of redefined my spiritual walk in the meantime. And that's also documented on this record, the, the realization and the eye opening of not just me as a person and a human being, but me as a spiritual being as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because the first times a grace record has faith as a recurring theme throughout the album. I was going to ask to what extent faith and spirituality plays a role in this new one. And I'd also like to just for further down the line, definitely state here that I would love to get into those topics in great detail with guests, um, you know, people of different spiritual walks of life with different beliefs. That's definitely a topic for me because I'm, I, I'm a spiritual person, but I don't subscribe to any religion. I don't really know that much about many religions because I didn't grow up in a religious household. I know you did. So you have oh, a lot yeah. of experience with it, but I, that's something I would love to go and, you know, explore in greater detail down the line. But just as a broad theme, is that in this record as well? Absolutely. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, it's a tricky subject to navigate because it's something that's different for everybody. You've got people, and I grew up this way, so I know I can speak from experience. You've got people who are taught, who are bred into a specific religion. Mine was Christianity. Being the son of a minister, you're, you're bred into it. So it's taught to you from a very young age since the beginning. So you're indoctrinated into it and you can't see out of it. And some people see that as refuge and safety and comfort. And you, you know what you believe, you don't question it, and life is good. Um, and that's good enough for some people. You know, I say if that's the way you are and that's how you want to be, more power to you. I, I, I think that's great. As long as you're not harming people, you know, and the problem that comes along with that is the judgment and the hypocrisy of it, because not everything that you're taught or those set rules and standards apply to everybody. You know, you're talking about a doctrine, uh, in this case, you know, we'll be specific and say the Bible, you know, because you could talk about the Quran, you could talk about, you know, the Torah, all of these things, the Zionist religions are kind of all coming from the same place, per se, which I know is blasphemy for some people. But um, those rules and those ways of thinking are ancient, technically. So how do you apply them to modern? Yeah, so how do you apply them to modern people now? And you know, I just got to a point, and this is a slow, long process, and you can see hints of it even in Killswitch songs over the years of me sort of, you know, starting to think for myself and questioning things and things that I was not supposed to question, you know, and that's a big thing about organized religion, because you could say the word religion can apply to anybody in their set of beliefs, that word religion, but it's just such a, you know, a hard word for some people, but, you know, organized religion, those religions that are big, that have labels to them and millions of people that follow them. And again, if that works for you, go for it. But the backlash that I get when I do speak about this is incredible. You know, people get super offended. I'm not telling you to change your beliefs. I'm legitimately just telling you, here are the holes, here are the flaws, here are the things that in my mind, just, I can't pretend to put a bandaid over this gaping wound anymore this does not work for me. And here's why. So I've been very, very careful and very poetic about talking about this topic. And, uh, you know, I've injected it into my lyrics over the years, but me as a person, this kind of a conversation doesn't normally happen. I think I've had it a few times and you have to be humble enough to listen to people and their opinions and humble enough to allow that space in your mind to question the things that you just see as absolute truth that will not budge. If you're not willing to budge, then you'll never find a common ground of understanding. You're never going to understand growth of somebody's spiritual walk. And for me, I've done an immense amount of growth because I finally dropped my guard and let go of these things that I used to cling to. And the feeling is incredible. I think now the relationship that I have with God, the higher power, the great spirit, whatever it is you want to call it, him, her, is so I am in a great place and I feel more peace than I ever did when I was a wound up indoctrinated person. And I'm open to other people's stories. And I'm, I like talking about this. If you're able to like not be angry and emotionally charged when you talk about religion or faith, you can find some profound things about each other. And I think it's a topic that more people should talk about, but 
that's a really tough, just like politics, it's the same thing. People get triggered and get super fucking angry. And for me, I'm just like, all right, cool. Believe what you got to believe. I'm not trying to piss you off. Go believe you, but don't you dare tell me how to believe because that's a personal thing. Yeah, they are the two things, not to keep going back to it, <laughs> just shamelessly plugging away, but there is a chapter in my book called Politics and Religion. Oh, and, yeah. And, and that's that's a topic, or there are two topics that I like to get into if the occasion calls and the moment feels right on my show. And you are right, like you're kind of always advised, don't bring up politics or religion down the pub because you never know who you're going to offend. <laughs> and it's so true because people, if they hear an opinion that's different to theirs, as you say, even if you're not thrusting it upon them they still feel threatened and sometimes angered and for me intelligence is defined by your ability to listen like that is the absolute foundation of iq mm -hmm. and empathy and everything is can you listen to the other side of the argument can you take in what's being said can you process it and apply it to your thoughts and you know perhaps then respond and then you have a dialogue and i do feel like well right now if you're listening to this it makes you the smartest motherfucker ever not because we're <laughs> smart not because we're smart but just because you're listening thank you but um it's an amazing thing to see people get so wound up because all you're doing is talking about it and and talking about it doesn't change anything you know but well, people just don't like hearing it do they it's it's funny. Yeah. it's it's a we've, delicate we've, zone we've got to remember that wars are waged over religion really i mean how many wars have been waged over religion it's it's ridiculous people are willing to kill and murder over religion and you know i've actually almost gotten punched a few times being in a pub talking about religion uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. big no no it's a big no no yeah when you get somebody who's you know drunk and you know a zealot it's you know which, which if you're a real religious zealot why are you drunk that's another thing but anyway <laughs> to each their own, you know, but I've been on this crazy journey and it's been super eye-opening. And I've actually even taken in um, some of my ancestry, you know, which I've discussed on, on before in, in social media and, and on episodes of, of podcasts. I come from such a diverse ethnic background from Native American to Viking. Wow. And these ancient um, ways that we used to practice our spiritual beliefs i've embraced those ancient ways and being up here in the mountains and being close to nature and uh, i've had these moments um and you know i'm not i'm not a psychedelic warrior anymore I, I used to just you know constantly you know you know if i have talked about this before but having moments in nature where i'm on mushrooms and i'm seeking something has been life-changing moments and i've really sort of started to see where our ancestors came from when they're talking about the spirits of the forest and the mountains and there's life you know those moments where you have you know your your brain is slowed down and you're seeing these intricate details in nature the design work the i feel like god is everywhere it's in everything and it's totally changed my point of view and i see so much more beauty now than i ever did when i was younger because i've opened myself up to experimenting and to questioning and you know, I feel like if you're not questioning what you've been taught or what you believe in, then is it really yours? Do you really own it? You know, do you really, can you really subscribe and live word for word, note for note, these, these hymns and these words that are spoken? If you haven't tested them, if you haven't chewed them up, spit them out, digested them, and you just got to do that kind of stuff. So my walk has been incredible and I'm more at peace now than I ever have been in my entire life because I just let go of things that just didn't work for me anymore. And this year has allowed a lot of people to do that, I think, because, you know, those large social networks have been removed and particularly coming from London, where I used to live in New York for you, um, not to totally bash the cities because the, the cities hold their own magic, but to escape the city and the hustle and bustle and the grind and the rat race and all that stuff that London and New York represent, you break away from it and you reconnect with, again, what you're saying, the true essence of existence, of being outdoors, of being outside, of being alone, of, of not being distracted, of not being, you know, from running from A to B to Z to D. You just, let's hit pause, let's take some time out, let's read, let's, yeah. eat, let's eat good food. Um, I mean... I feel the same as you, so connected to just like my inner peace, whatever that is, I'm still finding out and I hopefully always will be. And right. 
that, totally. that that's the trip right is you never want to tr- well you want to achieve enlightenment but we never will we never ever will but as long as we keep uh, you know striving towards that i think that's a happy existence if we're always on like a positive path and this isn't like the righteous path that we're talking about this is just positive what energy are you putting out into the world uh, and you know what are you soaking up and absorbing and applying and i love this kind of stuff man this again this year it could have only come out of this year for me personally i think this year really allowed me to address many issues that i left buried and you know hidden for so long and it's been an amazing period of just reconnection with whatever yeah i think another thing too that you'll see um when the world does get back to social um you know allowing us to be in the same room with each other the pubs and the restaurants and the people that you experience out in the country, you know, cause before this, you know, world went into lockdown and everything going out here locally and meeting the locals, especially where I live in Woodstock, there's a ton of interesting characters. You, you go from your, your hunter gatherer types to your straight up strange artists, you know, and people who live out here and are in touch with nature. Like, you know, my neighbor has been here her whole life. She's a country woman there is a different point of view than you will get in the city. City yeah. people have a, a certain vibe to them, which is great. You know, it's fun to dip in. And like, I lived in the city for, for so most of my life. Um, and I appreciate it, but I don't want to live there anymore. I don't want to live there anymore. I love the stillness. You know, last, last night I was sitting in my living room, all the fans in my house off, you know, windows closed, just sitting. I had incense burning and a candle lighting and there was nothing, just absolute no no car horns you know no no people shouting no nothing and you don't get that in the city so that tends to breed a certain type of person who thinks differently you know if if you go outside your front door and you can see the milky way you're going to be a different kind of person than someone who walks out their front door and they can't see shit because the city lights are there in the car it's just take away all that distraction and it breeds a different kind of person. And I really thoroughly enjoy my conversations back when the world was sociable with people up here. And that's something I'm looking forward to you seeing. I'm not sure how long you'll be in the country when the world goes back to normal, but country life is ain't so bad, man. You know, it's the people are different. And, you know, that being said, I've had some interesting conversations about religion with some real hardcore people who are super into Christianity. And I'm still open to that. My dad is still very much, he's not a minister anymore, but he's still very much a Christian. My Both my parents are very Christian, God-fearing people. And we still discuss things. You know, they, they, as much as they would love for me to like stay in the faith, they're open to talking and I, I'm not afraid to talk to them. And I've had some great conversations with my dad who I will give him and my mom big, huge respects for allowing that conversation to happen. Because sometimes in families, if you were born and bred into a religion, and you defy it and you question it, there's anger, there's divide. People will get shunned. Like the family can divide over this. And um, through discussion and growth, I've been able to talk and and I'm still open to hear what people have to say. Like I haven't made my mind up. This is who I am. Like you were saying earlier, there's no period on my sentence. I want to continue to grow and and to become who I am. And part of that growth is is country life. <laughs> it's like country people, man. I can't wait to get back to a, a scenario where I can sit elbow to elbow with somebody at a bar and and do this and talk about life, the deeper things. Because it is a taboo subject. But if you get into that conversation with the right person, it can be amazing. An amazing couple hour long conversation with somebody you don't know. And when the conversation ends, you know that person really well. I love that. And I miss I miss that about country life up here. Well, how about this? I was out with my dad earlier and he said it feels like it's the the only thing he can liken it to right now, the feeling in the air, which is palpable. It feels like m- what, what, what it must have felt like at the end of the war, you know, with the reawakening of social activities and people are starting to feel once again like, oh, life is allowed to happen again remember life yeah it's 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 not too far away now and almost like we've been cryogenically frozen for the last year and we're all coming awake and it i can only imagine the feelings of connection and euphoria and excitement and as you say like when you can sit down up close and personal with somebody down the pub again that you haven't seen in all this time i'm just tripping out thinking about it like of course 
as you said, we want to get back on stage. We want to get back to shows and all those things, but one step at a time. And really for me, I'm just thrilled to sit down with people like we're doing now and be like, what about this last year? And (laughs) do you know what I mean? Can you imagine those, the conversations that are going to take place when we run into friends and even acquaintances and dare I say strangers and be like, well, I've been in lockdown for a year. You have too. I know that. We've got a year to catch up on. Mm. When's that ever happened before? You might not see a friend for a year, but there's a hell of a lot to catch up on when the world does reopen. And that, for me, is such a thrilling, exciting prospect. Like, there's been some real fucking pain and hardship and heartache and a lot of death. And my heart goes out to anybody that's been directly affected. I've got a few friends that have lost parents, and it's been awful. Um, But life, as long as we're here, does go on. And I think that the beauty in existence will really be hammered home. Well, I think it already is. I think people are more aware than ever of how fragile and fleeting life is now, hopefully. And God, when the time comes and we can mingle once again, it's going to be just, it's going to be the best shit. Yeah. And I think what you just said about the life, life being beautiful and fragile, I think essentially that's what the entire Times of Grace record is about, is fragility and and being vulnerable. And um, I think that's why people relate to Times of Grace, because it is just a full on honest outpouring of you know pain and suffering and redemption, which is something we all go through. And that's what's been going on this past year. And I feel like we are going to be moving in a time uh, where we're going to see some redemption. I, down the street from my house, uh, a couple just opened a new business, which is a bold move to do during these times. And they're already advertising eat, drink, and dance. And I love that. I saw the word dance on there, you know, and they're only a couple weeks old here. Well, maybe closer to a couple months, really, but I haven't been going out that much. Uh, and I was just there recently, and, and my friend is the manager there, and they have a little mini stage, and they're already talking about when we can. We can't wait to see people dance, you know, we, and across the street from there's an outdoor place that has a huge outdoor spot and a stage. So, you know, as long as you're six, seven feet apart from these people, I cannot wait to watch people smile and dance. Like that's huge. And there's this thing that my father used to say, you know, um, don't forget how to dance. You know, your shoes are too tight, like loosen your shoes, learn to live, learn to dance. Don't forget how to dance. And I can't wait to see physically see people dance again, but also mentally and spiritually, just that feeling you have when you've just let all your inhibitions go, your problems go, and the, you're in the moment and music is blasting and you see your friends around you and you're just in that moment of dancing. I love, love, love that. Something a lot of people don't know about me. I love to dance. I love dancing and I miss that so much. I do it here in my house by myself, but it's not (laughs) the same. Um, And I think that I could tie that into the record as well, like learning to dance again. You know, there's a real heavy metaphor. It's not just about the physical act of dancing, but the way that it makes you feel that joy in your heart, that freedom in your heart when you're in that moment of dancing learning to find your feeding feet again and and that's just what it's all about life and this record it you know art imitates life and that's truly what this record is is just it documents that time that straddles pain and suffering into redemption and eventually joy it all sounds like the end scene of an epic film like lord of the rings or something doesn't it like we've all been on this epic quest together and we've endured And then real life is going to resume, but it's going to mean that much more because of what we've been through. And simple things, as you say, like having food, having a drink, dancing, going to shows, it is going to be like there and back again, a hobbit's tale. Only it's a worldwide shared experience. And for me, the roaring 20s, like whatever happens this year, you know, we'll see. But for me, 2022, I think it's going to be the most exhilarating, exciting, creative prolific incredible year of maybe our lifetimes like the roaring 20s is coming back 2022 i love that you heard it here first (laughs) (laughs) yeah you got to project that you know because the power of projection and 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 intention in your heart you know that's why people believe prayer is when I, i i'm one of them i believe prayer is powerful whether or not you associate with something religious 
you saying and thinking and focusing your efforts on this thing can make it happen. So having a positive outlook and saying those types of things and really believing them, there's power in that. You get enough people on that wavelength of like, the future is going to be good. It's going to be bright, you know, believe it. And I do. And I know other people do. And that's infectious. That's a great energy to like push onto people, you know, like things are going to get better. They are, they already are getting better and they're going to continue to do so. But uh, yeah, the analogy of the roaring twenties, I love that. It's just a great, that's a good theme for maybe the first dance party could be like a roaring twenties dance party up here. <laughs> Have you ever seen Broad Walk Empire? I have not. And that's funny because you did an interview with um, Stephen Graham and it's been on my to-do list. So I'll have to get to that eventually because I know he's he's a character in that and I, he's a brilliant actor. Yeah, Steve Buscemi in that show is amazing as well. But the reason I mention it is it's all set in the 20s in the Prohibition era and the music in it, all the 20s ragtime jazz stuff, and yeah. the swing, like that's some killer music. It still it sounds is. in the way the little Richard still sounds anarchic and untamed. A lot of the jazz from that era still sounds to me, at least fresh and exciting. Even if it costs me 600 pounds to come there and I'm only there for one night, throw that roaring twenties dance <laughs> theme party, Jesse, and I'll be there. I'll press my suit ready. Yes. Um, I love it. Let's, I think we should end the show there on that nice note. And we should also say this next week, we want to answer your questions. We want to bring you in. Hopefully now, this has been the opening trilogy of episodes. You've heard about us the last year. This year, we've kind of set the scene. Um, and now we want to open it up and bring you in. So next week, we're going to do a campfire question podcast. Uh, and you can get in touch with us um, via the email, stokethefirepod at gmail.com. Follow us on social media as well. We'll do some posts and you can comment on there and share stories, as we were saying earlier on. Anything you want us to bring up, touch upon, discuss. Um, you can ask us anything. And hopefully if the first one goes well, not only can we do you know regular campfire question themed podcasts, but we can also start bringing people into the Zoom chat on the show yeah. and, and really connect with people in real time. Because, you know, there's something to be said for that on air feeling of actually, you know, it being now here. Um, questions are great, but eventually it'd be good to get like real life, not just, you know, artists and guests, but listener guests on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you've been with the journey with us so far, first of all, thank you for, for sticking it out and hanging with us and seeing how we're rolling this out. But it really truly is just an introduction of us. And, and now we really are turning our sights towards you as well. We will have guests, like Matt said, and I look forward to that because I'm sure we'll have some great guests. But um, I, I really truly want to see how this, you know, we've already gotten some good stuff, but continue to, to do that. Keep feeding us your ideas, your thoughts, because I think, you know, you're going to just make this better. It's all about you, that reciprocation of host versus audience or band versus audience. That energy is what we're trying to replicate in any way that we can through social media and through Zoom, but you are definitely a big part of it. So please reach out to us and, and let's make this what it potentially truly can be a, a great podcast. And that community vibes, as we've been saying from the start, we want to we want to stoke that, strengthen that, encourage that. Um, dude, when the record is out, when the Times of Grace album is out, I know you can't give a release date or anything yet, but when it is out, um, maybe we could go through and do like a little more in depth dissection of the record, maybe even like a track by track guide, and we could just go through the record, talk about the inspiration behind the lyrics, the song structures. Obviously, we can talk about Adam in more detail and collaborating and working with him. Um, are you up for doing that? Of course, yeah, I think it'd be a great idea. Hell That's yeah! Cool. All right, dude. Well, uh, until next week, we'll I'll see you, and and you'll see me, and hopefully we'll hear from uh, all of you listening at home as well. On next time as well, make sure you're listening outside by the campfire. Send the pictures in and uh, keep the fires stoked. Yeah, man. I love it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. And Matt, another good one. Another one down. I love it. Let's keep it going. Keep those fires stoked, brother.